Let's go to Ottawa now. The government uh, holding an update on COVID-19. Let's listen. Here's nationally, the average daily case counts are now leveling off with continued regional variability across the country. As public health measures ease, increased levels of transmission are not unexpected since the SARS-CoV-2 virus is still circulating widely. Severe illness trends are still declining nationally and in most jurisdictions, with the average daily numbers of people with COVID-19 in hospitals and in intensive care units in the past week having declined by 11% and 14% respectively compared to the week prior. As we expect the SARS-CoV-2 virus to continuously evolve, we're closely monitoring the domestic and international situation and preparing for new variants. The BA.2 sublineage of the Omicron variant is increasing in Canada, but at a slow rate, while other sublineages are declining or stable. The growth rate of BA.2 internationally appears to be highest where there is a combination of low booster coverage and where BA.1 has not already driven high infection rates. While evidence suggests BA.2 is more transmissible than BA.1, BA.2 does not appear to be associated with more severe illness in vaccinated populations. However, it is still capable of causing severe disease among people without prior immunity, which underscores the importance of getting up to date with COVID-19 vaccines, including a booster if you're eligible. Over the past two years, Canadians have shown tremendous capacity to adapt to change and uncertainty as the pandemic has evolved. While COVID-19 is here to stay, we are now entering a period with more opportunities for in-person activities, gatherings, or tra travel. Some of us may be feeling a greater sense of comfort, while others may feel less at ease. Many people in Canada may be asking, may be taking into consideration factors such as COVID-19 vaccination status, the level of COVID-19 activity locally, underlying medical conditions, and risk to personal contacts to make informed decisions. This includes choosing activities that are best for their individual and family situation and using personal protections, for example, to continue wearing a well-constructed well-fitting mask as an important added layer of protection, even if not required by local authorities. We know that these proven practices, along with strong protection afforded by being up to date with your COVID-19 vaccines, have reduced the impact and severity of the pandemic. I encourage Canadians to show each other compassion and respect as we make decisions to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities, especially those at highest risk. These times of transition can be challenging and stressful to navigate. If you are having a difficult time, know that you're not alone and help is available. Resources such as Wellness Together Canada provide people in Canada of all ages, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with immediate free and confidential mental health and substance use supports, including information and practical tools and confidential sessions with social workers psychologists, and other professionals. PocketWell, a free companion app to the Wellness Together Canada online portal, provides another way to access online resources and to measure and monitor aspects of your well-being. Indigenous peoples can also contact the toll-free Hope for Wellness helpline. COVID-19 continues to challenge us and impacts us differently, depending on our circumstances. So let's continue to do what we can to support one another as we navigate the road ahead. Thank you. Merci, Megwich. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Après Hello plusieurs semaines, everyone. after many weeks of dropping levels of infection in Canada, the average infections have stabilized and regional variability 
still exists. While these public measures have eased, it's expected that transmission um, levels exist, given that SARS-CoV-2 virus is still circulating widely. Severe illness trends are still declining nationally in most jurisdictions. Over the last few weeks, the numbers of people with COVID in hospitals and intensive care units has declined by over 11 and 14 percent, respectively, compared to the week prior. As we expect the SARS-CoV-2 virus to continuously evolve, we are closely monitoring the domestic and international situation and preparing for new variants. The BA.2 sublineage of the Omicron variant is increasing in Canada, but at a slow rate, while other sublineages are declining or stable. The growth rate of BA.2 internationally appears to be highest where there's a combination of the following factors, low booster coverage and subvariant BA.1 has not already driven high infection rates. While evidence suggests that BA.2 is more transmissible than BA.1, BA.2 does not appear to be associated with more severe illness in vaccinated populations. However, it is still capable of causing severe disease among people without prior immunity, which underscores the importance of getting up to date with COVID-19. COVID-19 vaccines, including a booster, if you are eligible. Over the past two years, Canadians have shown tremendous capacity to adapt to change and uncertainty as the pandemic has evolved. While COVID-19 is here to stay, we are now entering a period with more opportunities for in-person activities, gatherings, and travel. Some of us may still be feeling a greater sense of comfort while this happens, while others of us may feel less at ease. To make informed decisions, many people in Canada can take into account many factors, including the level of COVID-19 activity locally, COVID-19 vaccination status, underlying medical conditions, risk to personal contact. This includes choosing activities that are best for their individual and family situation and using personal protection. For example, to continue wearing a well-constructed, well-fitted mask is an important added layer of protection, even if it's not required by local authorities. We do know that these proven practices, along with the strong protection afforded by being up-to-date with your COVID-19 vaccines, have reduced the impact and severity of the pandemic. I encourage Canadians to show each other compassion and respect as we make decisions to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities, especially those at highest risk. These times of transition can be challenging and stressful to navigate. If you are having a difficult time, know that you are not alone, and help is available. Resources such as Wellness Together Canada provide people in Canada of all ages 24 hours a day and seven days a week with immediate, free, and confidential mental health and substance use support, including information and practical tools, confidential sessions with specialists, such as social workers, psychologists, and other professionals. Pocket Well, a free companion app to the Wellness Together Canada online portal, provides another way to access online resources and to measure and monitor aspects of your well-being. Indigenous peoples can also contact the toll-free Hope for Wellness helpline. COVID-19 continues to challenge us and it impacts us differently depending on our circumstances. Let's continue to do what we can to support one another as we navigate the road ahead. Thank you, Miigwech.
Bon, merci. Normalement, on passerait aux questions. Thank you very much. Normally, we would move on to questions at this point. I think we do have a technical problem, though. I'm unable to recognize participants. We will try. Olivier, are you able to ask your question? Do you hear me? Yes, we do hear you. Oh, good. Perfect. My question is for Dr. New. Quebec will next week announce that a fourth dose will be offered to some Quebecers. I would like to know what you think of this. Will you be putting out a recommendation about another booster shot, a fourth dose? Thank you for this question. I know that the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is always analyzing data and evidence, and is surely in the process of analyzing the need for an additional vaccine dose. But I can't speak for Quebec. I do believe that Quebec authorities have been well um, advised and have recommendations from their experts. I believe that there is an expert panel in Quebec as well that has surely provided recommendations to the government of Quebec. But at the Canadian level, our committee, the uh, NACI committee, is continued evaluating evolving data, and at some point we will surely be having something to say about a dose. Very well, we'll see in the weeks to come, and we'll wait for your recommendations. More broadly speaking, what do you think of the strategy of using uh, booster doses, vaccine booster doses, every time there's a new wave of infection? Is this a viable long-term strategy? Is this going to work? Or at some point, are we just going to like run out of steam? That's a good question. It's a complex issue. Many things must be taken into account. Here in Canada, we've done a good job because with our experience in Canada, we have seen that we've taken good advantage of the uh, mixed doses of vaccines and also with, by, we've taken good advantage of the proper interval between doses. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization has advised specific periods between each dose. Um, for the third dose, it would have be three months after the first series is complete. This provides a more robust and long-lasting immune response. So that's to be taken into account when we weigh the validity and efficaciousness of future booster doses. Of course, the pandemic is evolving. New variants are likely to appear, and I believe that the people making the vaccines, unless the experts are continuing to analyze the situation, experts are looking at this closely to see whether as well we need to develop new vaccines in the future. There are a number of questions that scientists are continuing to analyze on an ongoing basis. I can't tell you right now what the future holds for extra vaccine booster doses. We may um, sort of find a rhythm where we're receiving new vaccine booster doses at specific times, but I can't give you any view of what the calendar for that would be. Hi. Um, what advice, doctors, are you giving to the federal government about vaccine mandates when it comes to air and rail travel and when it comes to federal workplaces? I think our, our role is simply to provide the scientific information about the effectiveness of vaccines, for example. And uh, so it is up to um, the employer and treasury board to make those decisions. So I think that's the advice for from our perspective is, is a technical one. 
Um, so I know that uh, those policies are under evaluation or review, um, including, um, for example, the, the federal mandates for the federal workers. And so I think um, you, know, you should certainly follow up um, with, with Treasury Board. And so what is the science telling you? Because I think most Canadians can relate to knowing someone who's been triple vaxxed and they've gotten COVID. Um, that's anecdotal, of course. <laughs> that's not a scientific analysis. But tell us, maybe if you, if you can't tell us what your recommendation is, what does the science tell you about vaccine mandates at this point and how useful they are? Yes, I think um, as everyone appreciates, the knowledge about vaccinations evolve over time. And I think with what's been the game changer, I think, is the Omicron variant, which is a vaccine escape variant to a certain extent. The good news, of course, as everybody appreciates, is that the vaccine after two doses is really pretty good at protecting you against severe outcomes. And after a uh, third dose or an additional dose, uh, that protection against severe outcome is augmented. What is uh, really being looked at is the impact of the vaccination against transmission and infection and, and, the, and also transmission. What we know is that with the Omicron virus, having two doses, particularly after a short period of time, the protection against infection and potentially further transmission is, is, goes really low. And you would then need a third dose to provide some augmentation of the protection against transmission and infection. And that also diminishes over time. So all of that should be taken into account as the uh, employer or the federal government uh, looks at the policies going forwards. At the same time, you know, I think on things like transportation, et cetera, any layers of protection to provide a tra uh, to protect the traveling public um, and to protect each other, I think is always a good idea, whether they are mandated or not. And so I think that's from a public health perspective, we're recommending what I would call vaccine plus other layers for now, because we're in a period of uncertainty where um, you know, the, the virus is still undergoing evolution. So getting up to date with vaccines plus wearing a mask is still a really good idea. Just, just do that for now, especially if you're at high risk. And so I think within the con construct of say a transport corridor or uh, a workplace, um, those are the sort of things that uh, people need to bear in mind as they make those policies. Did you ask your follow up, David? I'm sorry, I'm, I think I lost track. No, yes, thank you so much. Uh, Emily Bergeron, the Press Canadian. Emily Bergeron, Can Canada Press Canadian, Canada Press. My question is about wearing masks. The provinces seem to have different approaches depending on the province. Some have announced a date after which they won't be required. Others have possible dates after which they may not be required. Others have not saying anything about it. Is the federal government drawing up new uh, regulations, new directives regarding the use of masks? And when would we see them? Dr. New here, thank you for the question. It is a good question. We're aware that across uh, all jurisdictions, policies are evolving. But as Dr. Pam and I have said before several times, wearing a well-adjusted uh, and well-constructed mask, well-fitted, well-constructed, is a a good personal protection practices practice useful even if it's not mandated or required especially in certain contexts as i said yesterday i believe in another
another uh, press conference. If you're in a plane, this is a closed area. You're there for a while and close contact with other passengers. Whether or not there's a mandate to wear the mask, it's a good idea to continue wearing one for your own personal protection. So the message can be simple. Um, I think it's a good idea. Science hasn't changed on this. We know what the mode of transmission is. We know that the new variants are more transmissible. It's a bit like cigarette smoke. It can hang around in uh, the air right around you in the environment. So that's why it's useful to wear masks. It's, it's also useful to ensure that these inside spaces here in indoor spaces are well ventilated. I don't think we need underscore this uh, yet again. We all know what the science tells us about this. Even if it's an individual decision, I think it's certainly clear to me in any case that it's a very good idea to continue wearing masks if you're in an indoor space with other people. If I understand your answer, there will not be a new a new guidance issued, let's say, on the 21st of March, uh, because Ontario has dropped its mandate for mask wearing. You won't be communicating a new guidance on this. But when it comes to social acceptability, of course, this measure will or may remain uh, um, necessary in trains. Is, is it difficult for doctors such as yourself to get this message through clearly to ensure that people understand that, no, you go to the restaurant, you won't have to wear a mask, but if you go on a train, you will have to or you should? Or how can you adjust your message? Do you think this is going to make your work more complicated? No, I, I don't think it's such a complex issue. I think it's a good personal protection practice. As well, um, in what we've said today, we've made the point that it's also good to wear masks to protect others. There are several people who are immunocompromised or who have various mental conditions that put them at higher risk, higher risk uh, for catching COVID perhaps, but also for more severe illness should they catch it. So Canadians, we're all here to support and help each other. If we decide to wear a mask, it's not necessarily just for ourselves, to protect ourselves, but also having taken into consideration that we would like to protect others, too. So, yes, it's perhaps a bit more complex for people to, you know, go through and figure out the mandates. That's where you're uh, obliged to wear a mask. But beyond that, of course, we all have a right to make our own decisions. And we certainly support any personal decision to wear a mask because it helps protect you and it also takes into account protecting others. Uh, Dylan Robertson, uh, Winnipeg Free Press. Uh, hi there. Uh, Dr. Tam, I'd like to ask you a little bit about surveillance going forward. Uh, Dr. New kindly spoke to this yesterday, but I wanted to get your um, Anything new from you as well about what sorts of talks you're having with the medical officers of health from the provinces in terms of what type of reporting you're expecting going forward, how much of this might resemble flu watch, and if you have any sort of timeline on shifting from you know, this mode to something permanent that's a little bit perhaps more scaled back. Yeah, thank you for that question. And it is a topic of um, very live discussion at this point. Partly, um, you know, the, all, all the provinces are trying to adjust to look at what, um, you know, frequency of reporting, for example, that they're doing. But for sure, this virus uh, is undergoing evolution. It's here to stay. So there should be an ongoing sustained surveillance program. And... Uh, as you said, some of it will be built upon existing uh, programming and infrastructure like FluWatch. So one might expect that uh, on top of any resurgence of the new variants, we are going to be building upon a system of regular reporting uh, over the year 
may be escalating in the uh, respiratory virus season. And uh, in conjunction with all the other respiratory viruses, because really you can't tell in terms of the symptoms sometimes what you have, is that they must be more integrated uh, from lab testing to reporting and um, transmitting the information to the general public. So I think, you know, building off that towards the fall winter season is very important. But we have to have the flexibility to escalate testing, to escalate sequencing, to escalate um, the actual reporting as needed if a variant of concern emerges as well. So preparedness to how, do, how we do that is really important. And even rapid tests, you know, rapid tests, if you were to use them more strategically, you wouldn't use it at a time period, perhaps when the virus circulation is low, but you would then escalate that um, should we experience a heightened level of activity. Um, we are, uh, as Dr. New probably um, indicated yesterday, we have built some really great infrastructure over the last two years. And so that's, that's actually an enhancement on anything that we've ever had for influenza, which is great news. So the genomics platforms have been greatly enhanced and we will continue to do genomic analysis and make sure as much as possible our sampling frame of which viruses get sequenced uh, is robust going forwards, including from travelers, for example, and immunocompromised individuals where these viruses could mutate. So these sampling elements uh, are being put in place. Uh, wastewater surveillance, I think, um, has been mentioned as well. Right now, we have about 60% coverage of the population from some type of wastewater um, testing program. We need to not let that slip. We need to actually enhance that. And I, I believe Dr. New also mentioned that we wanted to increase that to 80% coverage, which in a country as vast as Canada with remote communities, um, it's not actually that simple compared to other countries and looking at watersheds and, and, and how we best capture data from wastewater is been a tremendous lift by many people. So we will continue to strengthen that as well. And we think that will hold great promise as an ability, uh, the device going forward is to inform Canadians about the activity within their, within their uh, communities. And um, so we'll continue right now. We are certainly continuing the um, mandatory random testing for arrival travelers, again, as a surveillance uh, program to detect variants of concern. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And of course, um, on top of regular case reporting from provinces, we have Sentinel Hospital Networks that can give us a really good sense of trends in terms of the severity indicators. And we're working with provinces um, on the issue. I would say this is a longstanding issue of uh, reporting mortality as well in more real time. We've had some gains during this pandemic, but we need to be able to solidify those gains. It's Thank doctor. you. It's Dr. Oh, sorry, yeah. The, uh, the other point I would make, uh, it's interesting uh, that uh, it, maybe it's sort of kind of overlooked is also as I think we have a very strong, I think, uh, surveillance overall with many components for vaccines and vaccination. And that's going to be very important moving forward as well, right? Obviously, uh, the data we have in terms of vaccine coverage, even for certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, age groups and so on, uh, certainly helps us and helps NASA in terms of developing the recommendations. Obviously, uh, it's very important as we uh, continue to roll out vaccines to monitor for, uh, you know, uh, adverse events and that that helps us in terms of uh, what we need to do in terms of uh, moving forward with our vaccine rollout. And of course, you know, uh, you know, the, the fact is that, you know, with the, with the vaccination as well, we can look at effectiveness. So if we do, we do get cases, you know, in terms of breakthrough infections, you know, transmissibility and so on, that's all part of it. So it's not just about the reporting on the cases, but, you know, were those cases vaccinated or not? I think it's going to be very important, especially in the COVID-19 context as we move forward. 
Thank you. Uh, and as a follow-up, I just wanted to ask about FAC's role when it comes to the federal jurisdiction and some of the restrictions around masking, around vaccine passports. I know it's a very broad question. It gets into workplace policies. But right now, we do have a patchwork in Canada where people go into a Service Canada office. There's a mask requirement. They go to a federal museum. It's a little bit different from what their province is saying. Uh, I'm just wondering what FAC role is in informing those discussions, where those discussions stand right now, if it's being actively looked at lifting some of those, uh, you know, masking and vaccination requirements for public facing federal institutions? Yes, I think um, I did just answer that question and maybe it wasn't, uh, it didn't quite hit the spot for you, but yeah, I, th I think the employer, the treasury board um, are actively examine all these policies and our job is really to provide them with the data that we have in terms of vaccines, vaccine effectiveness, both against transmission, infection and against severe outcomes. And, um, you know, together with other considerations. But I think the federal government has taken a very precautionary approach, very thoughtful approach, and is looking at the phase approach of removing some of these uh, policies. Um, and there will be, I think, uh, individuals who will, such as the people who have immunocompromised conditions and, and other um, underlying factors that make them more concerned about a workplace if there wasn't some of these um, measures in place. So I think there'll be a lot of discussions between the employer and the unions and others as well on this matter. But I know that these policies are being uh, reviewed and re-examined uh, as we speak. Valérie Gamache, Radio-Canada. Valérie Gamache, Radio-Canada. Hello, Dr. New. My first question is about people who've been infected with Omicron. We were told that those who got Omicron wouldn't need a third vaccine dose, at least not in the short term. Is BA.2 different? Thank you for the question. The simple answer is, if you've had an infection, been infected by probably BA.1 Omicron, it protects against infection with BA.2. That's the data we have right now. But about the third dose, and a prior infection, I think that there is a scientific aspect to that and an administrative one as well. If you have two doses, a complete primary series, then, and then the vaccine booster dose, you've got good protection. But if you have... All right, we have just been getting a live update from Ottawa government officials, Dr. New there, uh, and Dr. Tam as well, providing an update on COVID-19, saying that the case Cases have stabilized um, and that they do expect the cases as well to go up. And when it came to mass mandates and asked whether or not the federal government would have new direction coming out on whether or not to wear them, um, Dr. New said, no, that's really up to the provinces. But he said that most people um, should make that decision on an individual basis, that we know that masks are still useful and they should be used in some settings.